we're going to talk today uh, um, about the, the family I never knew I could have. Now, you know, family, family shapes our story. We all know that family shapes our story, but I'm telling you, I mean, your family of origin, as it's often said, your, the family that you came from, it shapes your worldview. I mean, it really does. It shapes how you, because, you know, when you grow up, all that you grew up with, whatever that was, that was normal to you. You know, whatever your daddy was, whatever your mom was like, or your grandparents, you just thought the whole world operated like that. And, and so I remember when uh, M- Michelle and I, um, uh, now look, if I want her to know what I'm about to tell y'all, I'll tell her myself, okay? Uh, th- this morning when I was leaving, she said, um, she said, what time is it? I said, it's 8 o'clock. She, and she set her alarm for 7.30 p.m. And so uh, she, she's not going to make it to this service, so I thought this would be a good time to talk about this. Um, so... When, I, when we were first married, uh, we were very first married, I, uh, you know, I, growing up in a family that hunted, you know, that's just what you did. And if, you know, if you needed hunting gear, you just spent the money and got the hunting gear. That's just what happened. Mama was fine with it. Daddy didn't even bother asking, you know. And so, you know, our first year of marriage, I got out of seminary. I hadn't got to hunt in years. And I was going to kill something that fall, you know, something that needed to be put on the grill. And so uh, we hadn't been married about a year, and, and I put in this big order for Cabela's, and I thought she was going to vomit. And, and uh, I really did. And, and I was like, what? We got in this big argument, and, and I was like, what? This is just what you do. I, I, I've got to have new stuff. And, and oh, man, no way. I mean, you just, and, and she was right. We did not have the money at the time. I mean, you know, I was still in a college mindset. If you had $10 in the bank, you could, you could go to McDonald's, you know. And so uh, I, but she, we got in this big thing because, you know, she didn't grow up in a hunting family. I mean, what are you, you're going to, are you out of your mind? And, and you know, and, and I remember also in our, in our first year of marriage, uh, you know, her, her dad, her dad, his big hobby is the yard. And, and uh, she projected that onto me. Uh, and, and so uh, little did she know that was not going to go well, you know? And so, because that's what you did on Saturday mornings. You know, you you get out and you work in the yard, and I'm like, wait, you you want me to get out there with you? It ain't going to go well. I I don't care if the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit's all involved. It's not going to go well. Uh, You know, I hate yard, anything related to the yard. I remember in our first year of marriage, one Saturday morning, I was, it was in the fall, October. That's football season, right? Uh, and uh, I, 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 she woke me up about 8 o'clock in the morning, and she's like, hey, I got a, a punch list of all the things we can do in the yard today. And I said, look, I'm going to get up, and I'm going to eat a bunch of food because uh, I was, you know, skinny and 25. And I said, and then I'm going to watch college game day, and then I'm going to take a nap. And then I'm going to eat some more food till I can get to noon when the first game starts, right? And, uh, and, and, and you know, but, but for her, that's just was normal, right? I mean, the, you, on Saturdays, you work in the yard and you have fun with it. And so, you know, that, the reality is whatever we do in our families, that's, that's all we know is, and, and she wasn't wrong and she wasn't right and I wasn't right about the hunting clothes and, she, and I wasn't wrong. It's just, it's all you knew, you know? And, and, and when you look at your family situation, it shapes how you how you view pretty much everything. And, and all of us, every single person in this room, I don't care how good or bad your family was, every one of us came from some level of dysfunction. I'm telling you. Um, we, we all came from some, I'm telling you, we really did. We all came from some level of dysfunction. It's, I mean, think about it. There is a billion dollar industry in therapy because of families, Right? I mean, why do you think families always, why do you think therapists always go back to childhood? Because that's where it got messed up. Right? And I mean, no, no, I'm kidding. I'm not kidding. It's, it's where things go wrong, and we, we have to undo all that stuff. And so I'm going to talk to you today about the family that I never knew I could have. And I, I want you to turn to Ephesians, uh, Ephesians chapter 2. It's in the New Testament. If you're watching it at home, uh, I'm on the New American Standard. If you're on a, a tablet or something or a phone, but uh, Ephesians chapter 2 it, it was written by uh, Apostle Paul. And, and here's what he's doing. He's, in his classic case, Paul is, is using who you once were and who you now are, right? I've told you before that Paul was a, a master teacher of the comparison contrast, who you used to be versus who you now are, and he does it all the time. And, and this is a great example of him t- talking about 
who we, who we were before we were in Christ and who we are later. So Ephesians chapter 2, we're going to pick it up in, in verse 12. He says, remember that you were at that time separate from Christ. That means before you were, before you were a believer, you were separate from Christ, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope without God in the world. But now... In Christ Jesus, you who were formerly far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Aren't you glad? For he himself is our peace who made both groups. He's talking about Jews and non-Jews. He himself is our peace who made both groups into one. And he broke down the barrier of the dividing wall by abolishing in his flesh the enmity, or that is the hostility, which is the law of the commandments contained in the ordinances. So that in himself, in Christ, he might make the two into one new man, thus establishing peace. And he might reconcile them both into one body through God, to God through the cross and by having put to death the hostility. And he came and he preached peace to you who were far away, and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have our access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens. This is an important verse now. You are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household having been built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole building being fitted together is growing into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you are also being built together into a dwelling of God in the Spirit. Boy, there's a lot there. Too much to cover on any, any, one, any one time. But, but I want to talk to you about what this idea means about the, who the church of Jesus Christ is as far as a family for us. Because Paul talks a whole lot right there about the two becoming one. So I want to point out to you this morning that at the cross, Jesus gave you access to his permanent family, right? At the cross, Jesus gave you access to what? His permanent family. Family. I think I got it up there. Let's look at the, so if you take, in case you're taking notes. At the cross, Jesus gave you access to his permanent family. And so I want, I want to tell you what, what, what I mean by that. You see, let me give you just a, a really quick, this is important for you to know about Israel. Israel, God did not choose Israel because they were awesome. Okay? And he didn't. He, he chose Israel in the, in the easiest form of the word. He chose Israel because they were the runt of the litter. You ever, you ever bought a puppy? Right? The small one. It doesn't get to eat much. Right? The runt of the litter is a runt for a reason. Well, Israel was this tiny little nation. Of band, this little vagabond group of people. And so the whole point was that if anything could come from that group of people, it would take a God to do it. Right? So when God chose Israel, he chose them to be a light to the nations because of all these pagan nations and all these uh, foreign God worshiping nations. When he chose Israel, he chose them to be a covenant people. So when Paul talks right there in verse 12 about we were separated from the commonwealth of Israel, it was a theocracy. It was, not a, it was not meant to be a democracy. It was led by God. Well, Israel was chosen to do that, but they rebelled. They, went, they got proud. The runt got proud of its new status. And they rebelled and began chasing idols. And so, so God's plan all along was that he was going to graft in the non-Jews, and he was going to do that through the cross to redeem the outsiders. So look at what he says in verse 18 right there. He says, for through him we both have our access in one spirit to the Father. We have, we have been, see, we were alienated. Paul, Paul says there in verse 13, or verse 12, that we were cut off. In verse 13, we were formerly far off. So we were alienated, and he brought the two into one through the blood of Jesus Christ that was shed on the cross. 
Now, the reason that matters so much is we weren't alienated from God. Now, this is important. We weren't alienated from God, meaning we, we didn't have to be reconciled because we got mad at each other. You know, when you think about reconciliation, you tend to think about two people making up, right? No, no, no. That's not what reconciliation means in the Bible. It means that we were the ones who went astray. And so we, we had to repent. And so when we repented at, at the cross, we have a chance to repent. And at that cross, we have access, as it says in verse 18, so the two groups, the Jews and the non-Jews, now have access to the same God. At the cross, Jesus gave you access permanently to a permanent family. You see, in a theocracy, there's a kingdom. God's the king. But at the cross, kingdom went to family. Your status changed. Now, status, status means a lot. At the cross, when you come to Christ, God's always been sovereign. I mean, if you're not a believer, if, so, if you know somebody, obviously you do, that's not a believer. If somebody's not a believer, it doesn't, it doesn't affect God's sovereignty at all. God is still sovereign. Jesus is still coming. There's still a heaven and a hell, whether people want to believe it or not. But, when, when that, so there's a kingdom rule of God. But when you come to Christ at the cross, you go from not only having God as king, but then you have God as father. And that's different. God's the father. We have access to, to one father. Status means a lot. When you came to Christ, your status changed. Now, we live in Williamson County. Status is a big deal here. It's a big deal. I mean, every county's got its stuff. Every, every culture has things that matter to it. I've, Michelle and I have been living in Williamson County now for, right, I think, 20 years. And I can tell you that status is a big deal here. People, you know, do a lot to achieve status. I, I, lo I love what Dave Ramsey says about status. This is awesome. We buy things we don't need with money we don't have to impress people we don't like. <laughs> is that not true? Amen. It is so true. You know, I mean, I, I just, I just, every time I read that quote, I'm like, there's a reason he lives here. Think of, you'll get that next week, <laughs> right? There's a reason he lives here. I also love his, what he always says about keeping up. That he says, uh, don't even try to keep up with the Joneses. They're broke, <laughs> right? St status is a big deal. It's a really big deal. But I want you to look at, at verse 19. It says, so then you are no longer strangers when you came to the cross, right? Because verse, what does it say? It says, it says that at the cross, in verse 16, that he might reconcile them both to, in one body through the cross, right? So at the cross, there was reconciliation. Now, now take a look at verse 20. In light of, of verse 16, look at verse 20. So then, or verse 19, so then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household, having been built. This is important having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. You see, when you came to Christ and you stepped into the family of God, you stepped into a permanent family. Now, many of you were in families, and you've been a part of families that have been fractured by divorce or abuse. Most people, when it comes to family, they have pretty rocky stories. But you need to understand that, that when you come to Christ, you're in a, a permanent family. And that family is built on the person of Jesus. The family of God was built on the person of Jesus. And the person of Jesus is eternal. The person of Jesus Christ doesn't break promises. Jesus Christ will not divorce you. Jesus Christ will not abandon you. Jesus Christ is the, the, the very heart of God the Father. And God the Father is not going to harm you. God the Father is not going to leave you. 
God the Father is not going to break his promises. God the Father is loyal. God the Father stays with you. God the Father is a loving Father. And, and I'm telling you, when you build a family on that, all of a sudden you see that it's not a broken family. It's a permanent family. And it's built on an eternal promise. And that's why the family of God matters so much. But all of that was ignited into motion at the cross. When he brought the two one and created an access way, a portal into a family that you could never have without it. So I want to talk to you about something this morning. That's a little touchy. So listen close because you're going to misquote me or you're going to say something that I said and I didn't really say it. But I want want to talk to you. I haven't really dealt with this in, in... the entire year of COVID, a year and 15 months. But I, I want to talk to you about something um, that me and, and many other pastors have been talking about in relation to this issue of the family of God, us. I, I would call it a, a deception gap. COVID, it, this is my own words, COVID has created what I would say is, is a uh, wrong slide. If you want to give, go right ahead. Um, uh, that would be great. I don't know how that happened. Um, see, there's our, there we go. Co- COVID has created a deception gap in the family of God. So now, what, what do you mean by that, Jason? Well, let me, let me tell you. Now, I, w- I want to say this before I forget to say it, because, you know, we live in a culture where everybody gets offended by everything anymore. And um, I know that many of you are... In, some of you watching from home, uh, you're in a higher risk category. You had to wait for the, your vaccines. You were, and that's great uh, if, if you wanted to do that. I mean, uh, some of you that are in your age bracket was more susceptible. I'm not, I'm not talking to you. And some of you, even people my age, one of the things I noticed with some of my friends, even friends outside of Franklin, you were having to take care of elderly parents, so you were having to be way more cautious. Even some people had more immunocompromised systems. Some of you had, had kids. Like I, I've, I've known many people that their kids had just had some pretty severe sicknesses, and so they had to take way different precautions. I'm not, I'm not talking about you. I'm not talking to you. I'm saying for just the average American across the nation, there's been a deception gap in the church. And, and, and in that deception, there's a level of fear that I, I am certain has been a stronghold in the body of Christ. And I, I'm not talking about Clearview now. I'm not, yes, at Clearview. I'm talking about the family of God in America, the people of Jesus, the church body. There's been a deception gap. I, I've, I've never seen people so willing to live in fear Willing to live in fear like I have in the last year of my life. Willing to believe the narratives that they're told. Caution's one thing. Panic's another. So what I want to say to you, and why, why, let me tell you why this matters. Because what we're discovering right now, and, and my heart goes out to people that are, are struggling with this. And I really, I'm not saying that to make you feel better. My heart really does go out to people that are struggling with this. Because more and more and more, I'm encountering people, you're encountering people, that they have been out of fellowship for so long, they don't really know how to get back. Let me show you a picture. When when you, maybe you're watching from home, when you think about the path back to church, does it look like that? Like maybe it's on this other side of a mountain and you've been gone so long that you, you're like, man, I I mean, we've talked to people. We have right here in this church. Other pastors I know are having the same conversations. There are people in our fellowships that they have been disconnected for so long and living in fear so long that they really, it It just seems like such a major hurdle to even get back into fellowship. And what I want to say to you is, don't believe that. Don't believe that. Don't believe that. 
You, you know how you get back into fellowship? Start. That's how you get back into fellowship. Start. The same people that were here when you backed off are the people that are here now. And we're going to love you just the same. Come out of the dark. You need the body. Let me tell you something. Digital fellowship works to a point. But when, when, when the scriptures are clear that we are not to forsake the assembling of ourselves, that is a commandment. We, we need each other. We need each other. We need each other. We need to, God did not make us to interact exclusively online. I'm telling you, he didn't, friends. Listen, praise God. Hey, man, if there's one thing about it, at Clearview, I don't think we're ever going to have to sell our congregation on the importance of digital ministry. I mean, especially those of you that are over 65, buddy. I mean, you saw how important that was. And, and when COVID hit us the worst, and our, I mean, we, I mean, it, 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 praise God for all the digital capabilities. But I'm telling you, digital is is not the best option when we can be together. Amen. And you need you need the family of God. And let me tell you why you need the family of God. You really do. Now, by the way, don't, don't get your feelings hurt if you're watching from home. I'm not shaming anybody. I'm saying I haven't dealt with this because for those that were locked in fear of COVID, it was real to you. And it actually still is real to you. But I'm saying to you, it is one thing to be cautious. It's another thing to live in panic. Do you think, friends, listen to me. You watching from home, listen to me. Do you think this is the first time God has ever experienced a pandemic? No, I'm I'm serious. Do you think this is the first time that God ever, ever thought, ooh, a plague, what should I do? God, aren't you glad that God never goes, oops? I mean, really? Aren't you glad that God never goes, boy, I never saw that coming? <laughs> right? No, listen. Listen, friends. The path back, if, that, if that's how you feel, I get it. I'm telling you. I've got people in my family. That picture applies to them. But I'm telling you, right now, you, all you have to do to engage the body of Christ is start. Just start. Start small. Go to lunch. Get back in your small group. Come to church. Sit over there. Sit by yourself. Look at people. It won't be as hard the next time. It's like going back to the gym. The first time you sit in your truck forever (laughs) going, I don't want to do this, you know? And then the second time you're sore and then you lose a few pounds and you go, hey, it's working, right? Get back into the family of God. Look at what Paul says in Colossians. Look at what he said. He said, since God chose you to be the holy people he loves... You must clothe yourselves with tender-hearted mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Make allowance for each other's faults, forgiving anyone who offends you. Remember, the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. Above all, clothe yourselves with love, which binds us all together in perfect harmony. He's talking about the people of God. He's talking about the family of God. The reason that the body of Christ is so important is because, let me tell you, inside the body of Christ, you can be something you could never be without the body of Christ. Without the body of Christ, there's a lot you're forfeiting. So I love that verse and the way the New Living Translation uh, breaks it down because he's talking about who the church is. And so I want to point that out to you. At, when it comes to the family of God, you know one of the things that you've got going for you? No matter how dysfunctional your own family might be, right here, I can be my redeemed self. Do you know that? That's one benefit, right? One benefit, look at it. I can be my redeemed self. Hey, one thing I love about the body of Christ is I can be me and you can be you. Now, we're not very good at that most of the time. We talk a whole lot about grace. We don't give it a lot. 
That's the truth. I mean, we, we, we know a lot about grace this way, but we don't do real well with grace this way. We really don't. M- most every one of us struggle with that, more so you than me. Um, <laughs> but just seeing if y'all were awake. No, we, we have a really hard time with people that are so different. But you know what, friends? One thing I love about the body of Christ, in fact, it's one of the things I love about Clearview. I mean, you saw it on the stage. We got all generations represented. Look in the crowd. We got all generations. Man, I lo- that is so neat. It is so neat that, that we're such a diverse generation population at Clearview. And within that, we see things differently. Sometimes we get mad at each other. But at the, at the end of the day, I can be my redeemed self. Because if I can't be myself here, where can I be myself? Where can I be myself if I can't be myself here? But you know the problem is, the problem is, we are so hard on each other. We are so hard on each other. Christians can be petty. I mean, just petty. Listen, if you're shocked that I might make you mad, you really need to go find a new church tomorrow. Because I'm going to make you mad more than once. Not even as a preacher, just as Jason. I mean it. You think I'm making this stuff up? I mean, if, if if you're let down with me, if you're disappointed with me, take a number. Because I'm taking numbers too. I'm disappointed with some of y'all at times. I ain't, I'm not kidding. That's life. Why do we act so shocked when people let us down? We expect saints who still sin to be perfect. And that's obnoxiously naive. Because the only place that's going to happen is heaven. And until then, we're going to get bruised. And we're going to bruise one another. We just, we are. So what did, what did he say in Colossians 2? Go back one uh, to that verse. Since you are the holy people of God, clothe yourself with tender-hearted mercy, kindness, gentleness, and what? Patience. Patience. Make allowance for one another's faults. Oh, man, stop being so hard on each other. Come on. Man, especially the last year we've been through, It is time in the body of Christ. See, but you don't get that in the world outside the church. The world outside the church is brutal with one another. The marketplace, the business world is brutal. Deception, lies, cutthroat tendencies. In here, man, I can be my redeemed self. But there's another thing I can be. Not only I can, I can be my redeemed self, that's the first thing I can be. But let's look at the second one. Go forward, too. I can, I, I'm also held accountable for my redemption lifestyle. Now, see, that's a big deal. That's a big deal. I'm, I'm held accountable. Paul, Paul just said in that verse in Colossians that we are God's holy people. We are called to be holy, friends. And holiness matters. Notice what he said in Colossians 2 in that verse I just read. He said, bearing with one another's faults, yes, We are to bear with one another's faults, but we're not to bear with one another's sins. You see, sin is different than just our hang-ups and our habits and our quirks. See, we are called to be holy. And I want to tell you, holiness before the Lord, it matters. Because God will not put an anointing on a group of people that refuse to pursue holiness. The farther I go in ministry, and the more I look out across the landscape of America with churches, you don't hear that much about purity anymore. I'm not talking about sexual purity. I mean just purity. A righteous heart. Righteous motives. Righteous intent. Purity. Purity matters. And it matters here. I can tell you, it matters here. It matters here. And and I'm the shepherd of this place, and I'm going to tell you, 
We are going to put up with each other's faults, but we will not put up with sin. You know why? Sin destroys. Sin destroys. You will never see a righteous harvest coming when it's sown in sin. On any level. Doesn't matter if it's money, status, greed, materialism, lust, envy, gossip. You will never see a righteous outcome sown in sin. When you plant sin, you will harvest sin. And we take sin seriously here. We're going to speak to it. We're going to love you through it. But we are going to hold you accountable. Because I'm going to tell you something. You know what I've learned about life? It's true for all of us. We want accountability for everybody else. Like Enron. And corporations. We want accountability for justice. We just don't want accountability for ourselves. And it just doesn't work that way. Because the most loving thing, let me tell you something, you guys. The most loving thing that you can do for me is if you see me as a believer heading down a path that's going to hurt me or my family, if you see me heading down a path of deception and you don't say something, that's not love. That's neglect. That's neglect. There's nothing loving about neglect. See, the, Bi- the Bible says if one suffers, we all suffer. Do you think if, you ha- if, you, if, do you think if, if, if your life goes headlong into sin, you think it doesn't affect us? Listen, man. In the body of Christ. Now, look. Now, some of y'all, there's people, I've, they're, they're, they've been in every church I've ever pastored. There's people that believe that they're just called, you know, to, to the, uh, uh, the rebuking ministry. You know, you need to go start your own church if you're going to do that. All right. But I'm telling you, friends, one of the worst impotent, limp, ministries in the body of Christ is accountability. Accountability matters because the body matters, because God's reputation matters, because my life matters. I had a friend of mine one time. um, This is a true story. There was a woman in this particular church that, for whatever reason, began liking this man. The problem was they were both married to different people. You know, you women, you guys have a way better radar. I'm telling you, I don't know where y'all get it, if y'all go to some cotillion class for it or something, but I'm just telling you, y'all have like this radar that we just don't have as men. You, You do. And I've learned to depend on it, not just with any, just all kinds of things. Michelle's got it too, and This one woman began to pursue my friend, and and as you might think, uh, they ended up having an affair, and their marriage ended up making it out of it, but uh, when that affair became public, It was interesting, about three or four women came to my friend's wife and said, you know, we all saw that something was up. We all felt like something wasn't right. And you know what my friend's wife said? She said exactly what she should say. She said, well, then where were you? Where were you? I didn't pick up on it. No, this lady was good at what she did. And by the way, it wasn't just her fault. It was his fault too. Let's make sure that's clear. But I'm saying, what kind of friend are you? To see somebody targeting my husband and and you saw things that I wasn't around to see and and, and you didn't say a word because you didn't want to cause trouble? Well, look what happened now. You see, if we're going to be in the body of Christ, we've got to be held accountable to a redemption lifestyle because our own lives are at stake. We are called to be holy. But that's not the only thing we're called to be. 
we're also have a benefit, not just of accountability, but I have a redeemed family surrounding my redeemed future. And this is a big deal. I have a redeemed family that's surrounding me. Some of you come from families where you feel, you know what, there's many of you in this room today, you feel more at home around the people of God than you do at your own family reunions. You really do. You've got common bonds. You've got fellowship that you never had with your own blood family. You see, we have a redeemed family. And when you're in a redeemed family, that redeemed family surrounds you on all sides. And, and I, I'm telling you, I think sometimes, I think we forget just what a, an amazing asset that is to our lives because, because we're so used to it. You see, when, when bad things go wrong and things happen and people die or people get sick or somebody loses a job or, or, your, or your, your kid goes off the rails, we're, we're used to having the people of God around us. But I'm going to tell you, as a minister... One of the things I see so often with those outside the church, when things implode, they really have nowhere to go. We take for granted this body of Christ. I'm telling you, friends, it is a sweet, sweet and precious thing that we have knowing that we've got real friends that can be there for us when, the, when everything's going wrong. I have a redeemed family surrounding my redeemed future so that verse in Colossians told us that, that the, the people of God that love what? That very last part of that, that Colossians verse said that, that love binds us together in harmony. Harmony. And that's what makes it real for us. I have a redeemed family surrounding my redeemed future. But I want you to know something. If you stay outside the family of God, and you stay disconnected from the family of God, if you stay living in fear of a pandemic, if you stay on the outside looking in, you forfeit all of that. You forfeit it. Because we weren't designed to do life from a distance. That's why you see mental health on the national conversation like never before. Because isolation is literally destroying people. If you, if you don't feel a part of the family of God, step to the middle. Step to the middle. And you're going to find people that love you and care about you. You can have a family that, that you never dreamed you could have. And if you, if you don't have that today, or maybe you're watching from home, or maybe, maybe you're a guest here, I'm going to say something to you. Okay, the Bible says in Ecclesiastes that two are better than one. For they have a good return for their work. If one falls down, his friend can help him up. But pity the person who falls and has no one to help him up. Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. If you do not have the body of Christ around you, let today be the last day that happens. Because you're isolated and you're vulnerable. And when the enemy can separate you, he will. You need the people of God. And we need you. You know, you often don't think about sharing something with somebody like a tweet or an email or sending them a sermon or sending them a podcast. You don't often think of that as missions, but it is. It's not that you have to send it to the whole world or post every single thing we do at Clearview on your feed. But if, if you've heard a sermon or if you've listened to a podcast, think through your life. I mean, God, who needs to hear this? Sometimes it, it, it doesn't need to go on your Facebook page. Sometimes it needs to go on your Twitter. But sometimes just a simple text to one person can make all the difference in the world is sending them the Word of God in real time. Share it. You'll be surprised how far it goes.